Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, as crime rises, should Montgomery County remain a sanctuary county? Should General Assembly change the law to allow total beverages, additional retail outlets, and lessons from the Michigan presidential primary? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by a former county council member and president at Rebuilding Together Montgomery County, Nancy Florine, and vice chairman of the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee, Stacy Sauter. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Congressman David Trone likes to emphasize his humble beginnings in his campaign ads, which some believe are to hide the fact that citizen David Trone is a very, very wealthy man. The source of Trone's vast wealth is his business he founded with his brother, Robert, Total Wine and More, the largest privately owned beer, wine, and spirits retailer in the United States. During the 2024 legislative session that's ongoing at the moment, the Maryland General Assembly Trone and his brother are now supporting a bill that would allow Total Wine and More to increase the number of stores it has in the state from two to eight. Nancy, the alcohol beverage laws in Maryland really were established in the aftermath of prohibition. When when the 21st Amendment allowed each state to fashion what laws it wanted to regulate the sale, manufacture, production, and transportation of alcohol. So isn't it a little unseemly for, you know, Senator or Congressman Trone to be, you know, wielding his political influence to try to really essentially change the law for his own benefit? Well, let me say this to begin. I mean, Maryland's uh, liquor laws are ridiculous. Uh, They're very constraining. uh, And it's an incentive for people to go to the district or Virginia if they want to acquire uh, alcohol, just because it's easier. It's a pain in the neck in Montgomery County. Uh, And I am guilty insofar as I, in my previous years on the council, I supported keeping our uh, county control over liquor uh, because we made a lot of money out of it. It's a good money producing experience. So I very much doubt that this bill benefits Trone alone. I'm sure that there are other, other beneficiaries of the rules, and I would say it's to 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 think that this is going to change the uh, consumption of alcohol in the state, which would be the concern, I suppose. I, I can't see that happening. It's really a matter of convenience for for purchasers, and uh, you know, there's always you know, business people are going to benefit from various decisions that are made at the legislature, whether it's about alcohol or anything else. Uh, that's before the alcohol, before the um, decision makers. So I, I really wouldn't get my panties in a bundle over this one. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'll put on my my an old hat of mine. Years and years ago, I was uh, general counsel for a an alcohol beverage trade association, and as I recall, you know, uh, in speaking to Maryland legislators about this, and uh, my, the head of the Montgomery County uh, Liquor Board at the time. You know, part of this part of the licensing issue was so that, you know, small retailers, you know, had an outlet and they weren't going to have to compete with the grocery stores and the, the mega stores uh, that were being, you know, starting to consolidate. So it, there, there was there was a purpose behind the law. Stacy, what do you think about this? Um, Well, I think that this is par for the course with the Democrats, because one of the things, regardless of whether or not you think this bill makes sense, it seems to me that one of the hardest things for Democrats to do is to use incrementalism as as an approach to good governance. Why do I say that? As because with other large proposals the Democrats put forward, they want it big, they want it now, and they want it all. And in this case, you know, quadrupling the number of licenses per individual, you know, why not start by doubling it? And only in certain zones to determine the impact it has on small businesses, this would give more evidence-based input and on whether or not it's a good idea to expand it further and likewise work out the kinks before it gets too big to fail. 
Uh, the irony to me is David Trone has that purported net worth of like $2.4 billion and his current ad campaigns seem to have a, a current theme um, of helping the little guy, you know, and so their personal testimonials on how Trump actually helped them out through a particularly challenging personal problem. And, um, you know, he has two bottom lines to be concerned about. One is certainly in his family owned business, and I don't blame him. The other is political. And in my opinion, this makes for bad optics because um, there could be potentially unfavorable outcomes and bad headlines for him when the big box stores come in and kick mom and pop to the curb. So, again, they want it big. They want it now. And they want well, it all. I think it's very we, I got, we, we, we're gonna, we only got about a minute or so left. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, I took I take this from a very different perspective than either either of you. I, I just feel, think it's unseemly that um, Congressman Trone is using his, you know, is is using his influence to try to change the law in a year when he's running for office, uh, a higher office. So I, it's just interesting the different perspective, and to to kind of sum this up, Virginia has no uh, limitation on the number of stores and number of licenses that can be that can be owned. Uh, so maybe it is time to change the law, but I just didn't think it should be done. This year, Nancy, I'm going to let you have the final word on this. Uh, we got about 15 seconds left. Well, I don't think that uh, Montgomery County's rules would permit uh, a total line in Montgomery County, anyways. Uh, so that's our loss. Uh, <laughs> I, and as I said, I don't think he's the only beneficiary of this le legislation, and I think that's a fair point too. Well, consider. actually, there there are, as you know, there are some independent retailers like Belby's on, on Rockville Pike and, and one or two others. So the, the idea that one of those sells to total wine isn't out of the question. So uh, it, it may affect Montgomery County consumers as well. Our next topic, it's kind of one, a little more serious one. Last, the last day of February witnessed both the sitting president of the United States, Joseph Biden, and the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, each taking a trip to the, the U.S.-Mexico border to address the crisis that exists there. Now, according to reports, 7.3 million migrants have illegally crossed the southwest border since President Biden took office in January of 21. And think about this. That's larger than the population of 36 individual states, including our own state of Maryland. So, uh, so the issue about illegal uh, immigrants coming to the United States is also wrapped up into the crime issue. Nancy, in 2019, just as executive, County Executive uh, Mark Elrich became executive, he said at the time, he designated Montgomery County as a sanctuary status. And he said at the time, we don't interact with ICE. You know, is it time to make a change there? Because the immigration system, uh, ICE, the enforcement agency, has 119 detainers in this year alone to uh, detain individuals who have been arrested in Montgomery County for crimes and are in jail. Is it time to change the law or the status, I guess? No, I think it's pretty two-faced of the Republican Party uh, to make this an issue at this point in time when you're holding up funding on Capitol Hill to address a lot of these issues. You know, I saw uh, a story on, I think it was 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago that showed a hole in the wall and a streaming of uh, people coming through it in Texas. Uh, and they were actually all Asian people. They weren't, you know, people from uh, Central America. So I think everyone agrees there's a problem and nobody wants to spend the money, I guess, to address it, that you all want to make it some kind of political issue for next year. Uh, we have it uh, this fall. This is an issue right now. There's no question about it. And the question about sanctuaries is who's going to pay? Are, are local governments supposed to do the Fed's work? That's what that's all about. And why should we? They should be doing it. It's their job. They just don't want to. They don't have the resources and they want local governments, your local tax dollars, that should be focused on other things uh, to implement uh, federal regulations. That's not how it should be. And, uh, you know, we, the county complies with what it needs to do uh, under national federal law, and that's okay. 
that's all right. And I don't think there's any question about it, but we're not gonna, this is not, a, has, well, doesn't well, the, have anything the, the, the to do real, with local but, crime. Yes, it does. Because if there are 119, so. if there are 119 individuals that are in our jails and ICE issues a detainer, Montgomery County, should at least honor that detainer. Stacy, I got to I'm going to go to you on this. So, it, it, with all due respect to Nancy and her opinions, she's just wrong because Biden rescinded a bunch of executive orders on day 1 in office and that border was essentially under control with a minimal amount of people coming over and they had to stay in Mexico if they were applying for asylum. And I and I, and I realize I realize that. Let's but focus on forward, Montgomery County. Yeah, no, but moving forward, what I'm saying is she mentioned the, the bill, you know, that or, okay. or the fact that the Republicans were That's obstructing fair. the bill. But it, it was a complex bill. We need to secure our own border first. And here in Montgomery County, to your point, that the the county executive made the decision, it was Isaiah Leggett back in 2014 to decline detain to decline the detainer list. And now all of a sudden that we've got this surge in crime, they're reevaluating this. It's unclear what will actually end up happening with it, if they'll get hard on it or not, because it's not their style. So we are all, this community, our communities are all at risk, not just for hard crime, soft crime as well. Very briefly, I will tell you, you know, I'm a realtor. I do a lot of business in this one complex, uh, condo complex up in Gaithersburg. I have out of town sellers. I went to one of the units last month. We um, were getting, getting ready to put it on the market. It was an illegal immigrant in there and she is um, running an illegal daycare center. Um, she subletted the apartment from somebody else. She had 12 children in there under the age of three in a one bedroom apartment with a pet rabbit um, and a, a, an unauthorized hammock hanging from the ceiling. So this, she was, the, she doesn't speak English. What if ha something happened? So these are kind of the soft crimes that are going on that we don't even know about, um, you know, publicly, but if there was a fire, she could have never gotten all those children out of there. Never. It's it, it's we really have to crack down to Nancy's point. We don't have the money to take care of all these people. They're going to be taking care of themselves in ways that are potentially illegal and harmful. So, Nancy, um, I, 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 I know you want to respond to this, but let me let me, you know, the, the this week, ICE officials met with Montgomery County uh, officials as well to discuss the detainer issue. Uh, it, do you think there's going to be any change in 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 that in that status going forward? I don't think there is the problem uh, that you're identifying. I don't know all the facts, but I do know that if the detainer is properly issued at the proper time, the county has gone along with it. So I think the the real issue may be a communication problem. Uh, Montgomery County understands that. Uh, what the rules are and what the rules are not, and has the right uh, to spend its money the way it it, it needs to uh, under the current situation. So the idea of doing extra work for the feds is really what it comes down to. That's the policy issue. And I ask you, uh, federal enforcement should be handled by the feds. And frankly, uh, to Stacy's point, if someone is running an illegal business and illegally, they should be uh, punished just as well. I suppose Stacy reported this person. Did you, Stacy? Um, I have a fiduciary obligation answer. to take care. Of Did you? Can you answer my question? I'm sure you did not, because I, that would have Nancy, I, Nancy, I have a fiduciary obligation to my client to report it to her and let her make the decision on it. So that was not there up to me. But, so, then she, yeah. but then she took appropriate steps. So the, you know, but that's what I'm saying. These are soft crimes that are going on that we you just don't know about. But people are being harmed. And uh, to your point, yeah, great. Ask the federal. Um, you know, you're asking the federal government to provide money for this. Why don't you just do the job and shut the shut the border down? Well, you know, that's a that's a bigger issue that we can't can't okay. decide on right okay. now. Well, tell your friends on Capitol Hill to stop behaving. Well, start behaving. Well, like you know, that. look, you know, there's 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 two sides to this coin. Um, there, you know, there is there is existing law, Title Eight, uh, Section Two Twelve F, gives the president. The uh, you know the authority to deny entry to any individual. So there is existing law. We don't want to ignore existing law. We should enforce existing law. And President Biden, I believe, should have the uh, authority to act if he chooses to do so. 
we got to wrap it up and go to break. Um, a much more fun topic when we come back from this short break, which is lessons from this week's Michigan presidential primary. There are weaknesses showing up on both sides, so stay tuned. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. When I first saw a turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. love. And welcome back. In most election years for presidential candidates having a good showing in the Michigan primary, it's a really big deal because it may have hidden meanings for the general uh, election and which candidates have an opportunity to win 15 electoral college votes. But this year's contest that held this past week was rather odd as the president, as the principal candidates, Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, really had no opposition uh, whatsoever. But so you got to peel back the statistics and the, uh, of, and the numbers to demonstrate whether there was a strength or an exposed weakness. Nancy, Joe Biden earned a healthy 81% of Democratic votes, 612,000 some, but there were almost 100,000 votes represented primarily by the Arab American and Muslim communities that voted uncommitted. And as many you know, report, this is a, an area of weakness that might be shaping up for the current president. What's your, what's your thoughts? Michigan is unique, I think, in that it has that category of uncommitted. I mean, my reaction would be, why bother if you're not going to vote uh, for this? There may have been other things on the ballot in Michigan. There were some local issues that may have brought people out to vote. Uh, their turnout, I looked at the statistics, they're about um, a little over 8 uh, million registered voters in the state of Michigan. Uh, uh, both parties were at about... Uh, a million. So the turnout was around, I think the Democrats' numbers were lower than the Republicans. Uh, the turnout was about a little below, or around 20% for primary. That's pretty typical, and that's disappointing in, in that, you know, that's where decisions get made, but not this year. Uh, there was really nothing on the bell, on the presidential level uh, to argue about, except to make a statement. Some people of course, on the Republican side, don't like Trump. They got a chance to say that. And some people on the Democratic side are ticked off about uh, national policies. The real question is, what does that translate into in the general election? And I don't think it says much. Uh, let's hope the turnout is better for the general election. Uh, last time around, Michigan was pretty good. They had something like a 70 percent uh, turnout rate. Uh, that's great compared to uh us in Maryland. Uh, so we'll yeah. see what the, you know, the ultimate numbers will will be uh, come the fall. So, so I don't think for much of anything. Yeah, well, this, I, actually, I think your point as to maybe the, the lack of enthusiasm uh, is, is, is quite revealing because only about 800,000 voters came out on the Democratic side. There's a lot of I mean, Michigan is a blue. Michigan is a blue state. So, does that show a weakness? Not only because a hundred thousand voted against President Biden, or does it show a lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden overall? I think it says they didn't, says to us they didn't have much of a choice, and they've got better things to do. Okay, I, I think that's. I think the primary season is pretty much a snooze across the country because it's already ready. 
predetermined who the candidates in the general election are going to be. And okay. I so I think it's going to be interesting for Maryland. Are people going to show up? Because at least there's a senatorial debate on the de Democratic side. Uh, but again, otherwise, it's it's a thing to do. But well, it's not going to make let's, any let's, big decisions let's, let's, for the party going forward on either side. OK, well, let's talk about Stacey. You know, former President Trump received 68 percent of the vote and challenger Nikki Haley earned 26 percent of the vote. Does that show that there's still a considerable division in the Republican Party? No, um, I actually think that while Haley's number is somewhat respectable, considering what we might have expected, she's out of runway and it's clear she's not going to be able to win. But if giving the voters a choice on Super Tuesday is what she wants to do, then go for it, girl. You know, I was a little bit disappointed that it was called so soon. I mean, you I turned on the TV at seven o'clock on the 28th and it was like they had already called the race. And um, getting back to the point about the committed, um, I think swing, Michigan is not necessarily a, you know, like you say, it's blue, but it has a uh, swing. And, and we're seeing this, I think, that neither party can afford to lose those votes, in my opinion, after the results that just came out, especially the Democrats. If you do the simple math, you had like 1.8 million votes cast. And um, I think that the, for, on the Republican side, it was like something like 1.14 million going to Trump with 786,000 plus going to Biden. So you have a 300 and some thousand vote deficit for Biden and for the Democrats. And so what's Biden going to do? And, and if, if it boils down to what's going on in the Middle East, Netanyahu is unrelenting in his mission, mission until he wipes out Hamas and uh, gets the hostages back. So uh, they're going to have to work around the fringes on that. But sadly, there will be more loss of life and it will make Biden's hands look bloody. Um, you know? let's, let's talk about the Republican side. I mean, President President Trump has some vulnerabilities, obviously, and there is a large portion of the Republican base that didn't vote for President Trump in 2020, aren't likely to vote for President Trump in uh, this in this election. And, you know, so it's not you know, uh, an easy path for President Trump. He still has multiple lawsuits that are out there uh, that could impact the election. And there are those that say that if President Trump is convicted of a crime, they will not vote for him. So how does, you know, how does how do Republicans go forward on uh, with all of those things considered? So from the inside, looking at this, we are moving forward as if Trump is going to be the nominee and coalescing around uh, support for him. Um, there are going to be people out there that are going to sit on their hands if he gets convicted. We know that. But if you look at his numbers by comparison to Biden's in, in Michigan, that may foretell that even if we lose a certain number of people based on convictions, it will still be his race to lose. Well, he can't he can't win without independence. That, that's for sure. Uh, what I thought fascinating and, and this, you know, I'm, everybody's trying to read tea leaves. Right. It's just I thought there was a little more enthusiasm on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. And that may be just because they're not the party in power. But, uh, you know, as as you know, it's fascinating to watch. I can't wait to see what happens here in Maryland. Maybe, you know, it'll. Everything will be, you know, done and buried and, and there, nobody will come out. But I think that Senate race is going to bring out people on both sides because of the Democratic side and the entrance of Hogan on the Republican side. It'll be fascinating. Stay no, tuned for Party Shot. Hey, world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight, both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. When well, not in your hand trying to text somebody back, because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. 
Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. And now with parting shots, Nancy Florine. Uh, two things. Uh, there's still time to sign up to be uh, an election worker and the primary and the general coming up. They're doing training in, in March. Uh, and I will tell my Republican friends, we never have enough Republicans signing up to help in the election. So um, if you want to watch Democracy in Action and learn how the details work, uh, you can go to the Board of Elections website and sign up. The other thing is, uh, WUSA had a great show on the Scotland community this week. Uh, Google it and watch if you want to know about Montgomery County history. Thank you. And uh, now with her parting shot, Stacy Slaughter. Well, as vice chairman of the Montgomery County Republican Party, I echo Nancy's um, thoughts there about getting uh, Republicans to work the polls. We have our own effort underway trying to recruit people. I also want to let viewers know that we have the Montgomery County Republican Party Convention on April 20th at the Doubletree in Gaithersburg. Tom Homan, uh, the former director of ICE, is one of our speakers. We have Sebastian Gorka. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from Larry Hogan's team. So we've got a, a good uh, all-star cast coming in. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both for your insights today. It was a very, very lively debate. And I want to thank you for appearing on uh, 21 this week. And I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.